Hi, everybody. Um, it's my true pleasure and honor to be able to introduce Professor Lior Tachtel. Uh, came all the way from Caltech and um, prior to being the chair professor at CS and the biology department at Caltech, he spent uh, I think 18 years as a professor in Berkeley. Uh, prior to that, he got his, his uh, PhD at MIT, and part of that, his undergrad was at Caltech. Uh, preceding that was his uh, high school high school days in um, Pretoria, Pretoria Boys High School, he, where he, he was one year junior to some other boy by, uh, by the name of Elon Musk. <laughs> uh, so as you can see, that school has only been improving. <laughs> and today, and, and I should say that uh, some of you know he has this uh, wonderful uh, blog uh, by the name of Bits of DNA, which taught me much of what I know, the little that I know in genomics. And so I warmly recommend uh, you check it out if you haven't seen it. And with that, I'll give you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks. So, um, really, very happy to be here. Uh, uh, I love, uh, I really, I love information theory. It's not something I studied and I don't really do. I don't work in it, but it's a field I got to know over the last couple of years working with some collaborators, um, and I've come to believe it's a very important area for genomics. And, and what I thought I'd do today is give sort of a basic talk. I might bore some of you, but um, so I hope to get some foundations in this one experiment we work on and try to at least give you the sense of why I think uh, sort of the kind of thinking in information theory is relevant. Um, so um, this is a picture, and I think by now, genomics is such a hype field, and so many people that you've all probably seen pictures like this with dots or some cells or something like that. And um, what we do is, uh, we ask questions like, uh, you know, so each of these dots represents some, it's like, uh, you know, it's a two-dimensional picture of some very high-dimensional vector, and people cluster the data, they do all these sort of things, and they, one of the key challenges is, you know, to ask questions like, you know, what's different between these dots and these dots, you know, what, which of the coordinates is distinguishing them, and lots of people work on this, and one of the, you know, information theorists work on this, so this is a paper I like. I thought I'd just begin by mentioning, I'm not going to talk about it, but it's from one of your colleagues here, might be some of the authors of it, you know. Um, and it's actually an interesting paper that points out that the biologists, what, they, what they've been doing is clustering the data and then running a t-test or some test to see, you know, what, what's different. Um, but if you cluster the data, uh, you know, you're actually actively partitioning it, and so you will get artificially uh, low, I mean, you know, artificially significant p-values um, by virtue of the fact that you sort of proactively first partition the data. Then, you know, if you partition the data, you'll find differences in what you partition, right? So, so they uh, wrote this very interesting paper, um, which is, you know, it's a statistics paper, but it's a sort of question um, that you know, information theorists kind of point of view of what's wrong with the way people are doing things. It's actually a very important paper because this is one of the main ways people work with this data. Now, why am I telling you about this? Well, I want to tell you a quote that, uh, that biologists often quote. I'm, I'm, a, I'm now a, you know, also a biology faculty, somehow I got to do this. And they'll say, you know, if you're experimenting statistics, then you know, you should have done a better experiment. And actually, this is something biologists, many biologists actually really believe this, um, and, and uh, not just biologists. And there's actually uh, some truth in this. I mean, you know, a lot of time the dynamics in computational biology now is that so when people do an experiment, they hand it off to some statisticians and, uh, and then they, they analyze the data. But maybe if you actually just did a slightly different experiment, you don't need to develop some very complicated, you know, algorithm that solves an empty complete problem, which is also something computational biologists is still going to do. <laughs> so, um, so in my group personally, I have a real dilemma because I have both an experimental lab and a whole bunch of computer scientists, statisticians in my group. Um, this is a list of some of the people, and I just wanted to you to look at, you know, I colored them sort of by whether they're 
doing experiments with pipettes or, or computers. And, you know, there's people who are chemists in the lab and people who are um, math and stats. Vasilis has been jointly advised by David Che here, um, he's an adjunct postdoc. So I actually, that's, we, we think a lot in, in my group, like, you know, which, what, what's the right arm with which to actually solve the problem? We could try to think about really algorithmic solutions, or we could maybe create some better data. And there's trade-offs, you know, going into the lab is expensive. And, uh, so this is something we think about, and we, we cannot just choose one or the other, which is um, a luxury in a way, but it's also a bit of a curse because at least in computational biology until now, there's not been tremendous engagement from the information theory community, but this is exactly the kind of question that information theorists who are trained to think about, is like what's the optimal way to trade off various experimental knobs you can tune versus, you know, or if you're going to do an algorithm, what's the optimal way to do it? So, and what information is in your experiment? So I want to tell you about like um, a specific setting where this is relevant. And, um, it's what I call a sequence census assay, and I will tell you in a second what these are. Um, I made something that looks a little bit like a sort of commutative diagram in mathematics, and it's actually uh, took, took me a little while with the, my student Sina, who is Sagi, who worked on this with me, to sort of try to actually write down like this particular kind of experiment, like what it actually is. So I'm going to go through this picture in detail in a moment, but each label here is a set. And I'll try to explain that what we're doing in these experiments is that we get some data, we measure one of these sets, and we're trying to infer something about these other sets. And there's various canonical natural maps between the sets. These are injections, this is a bijection, this is an inclusion map. And so this is the structure of an experiment. So if you've heard of single cell RNA-seq, probably many people have. Well, this is actually what the experiment is. And I think one of the things we've realized is that actually trying to understand exactly what the experiment is um, has been very fruitful because people tend not to do that in our field. So, so what we're trying to figure out is like, let's say, what are the elements of R? And we're given data and F. So of course, after that, there's more analysis. Done. So let me try to explain to you what is going on here. And um, I have to say, I haven't actually tried to present the, the biology in this way before, so I have to bear with me for questions, please just ask. So the sequence census experiments are a class of experiments that started around 2006, six seven, and they coincided with a dramatic drop in the cost of sequencing. And what happened is that as, you know, company Lumina is, or, you know, is actually started, it bought a company Selexa around this time, so when it entered the sequencing business. Before that, there was a kind of steady decrease in the cost of sequencing. This is the cost to sequence a human genome. But then suddenly there was this phase transition and there were basically some, one of my colleagues at Caltech actually, Barbara Wall, she was instrumental in realizing that what this meant is that you could actually parallelize, use DNA as a sort of counting mechanism to parallelize experiments and explain what that is. So, uh, so she wrote a paper where uh, uh, basically proposed using DNA sequencing to count. So not really to sequence genomes anymore, but because it's cheap to count. And uh, she called it sequence uh, census. And she wrote two of the first key papers. There was a paper on RNA-seq, which is one of the most important, and CHIP-seq from her lab. Um, and she actually wrote a review paper later um, with a guy called Rick Myers, where they sort of noted that sort of like Edison's photograph where it was invented actually to be an answering machine, but then ended up being co-opted to be a record player. It's kind of what happened with DNA sequencing. It was invented to sequence genomes, but actually it's now the primary use of DNA sequencing is to count. And um, actually today it's not so maybe so obvious, but the actual primary application for DNA sequencing, like the main use of the machines today is to actually count the number of chromosomes um, uh, uh, from blood of pregnant mothers to detect whether their babies have tro three copies of tro chromosome 21. And that's a counting assay. So this is how um, DNA sequencing is used. And the paradigm looks like this. So you would like to measure something, make some desired measurement. I'll give some examples. You might want to measure in a single cell what is, what are the, molecule, what are the RNA molecules? 
Or you might want to measure something much more complicated, like what's the geometry of the chromatin, the DNA in, in the genome. Whatever you want to measure, uh, you become creative and you reduce it to, in the computer science sense to a counting problem where you're going to produce little sequences that count something, some molecules, and counting those molecules will suddenly tell you something about the measurement. The, the molecules have been generated in order to reveal something about the measurement. And then once you get these counts, then there's some inverse problem where you have to go and figure out what, what was in there. And that's a noisy process, and there's, um, this, this is also a noisy process. That getting the molecules, sequencing them, all of this is noisy. Um, and this kind of paradigm is essentially, I think it's fair to say, you know, overtaking classic biology right now. So like, even five years ago, most labs would not really be engaged in this kind of enterprise, but really, very large numbers of biology labs now, especially molecular biology labs, but more generally, um, basically do this. And you can operate in a mode where you use a known assay, or you can try to develop your own. And then it's very interesting, actually, because you have to be having biochemists together with statisticians. It's an interesting interface. Um, the assay I'll focus on today, and I may have too much material, but we'll skip at the end. I'll try is single cell RNA seq. And this is a fascinating assay. So, biologists have studied single cells for decades. But it was only in 2009, which is exactly 10 years ago, that there was a paper published where someone managed to measure the RNA content in one single cell. So, cells have, a single cell has a genome inside its nucleus and it's producing RNAs, which some of them go on to make protein. And there are about 20,000 genes. That is to say, sequences that can produce RNA. And a typical cell has probably around 300,000 RNAs. So that might have 10 copies of gene 1, a couple of gene 2, and altogether it has about 300,000 molecules. And these molecules are representing really what the cell is doing at a specific time. Every cell has the same genome, but this measurement is sort of a signature of what the cell is doing right now. So in 2009, somebody published the actual transcriptome which I, by which I mean a probability distribution on these 20,000 genes for one cell. And in the last 10 years, basically by virtue of this kind of sequence census methods, by converting this measurement into DNA sequencing, uh, there's recently, in the last one or two years, there's now single experiments that are assaying close to one million cells. So that is um, quite astounding. Like the doubling rate here in the number of cells is Yes, it's far exceeds Moore's law. And the output of these experiments basically is a big matrix, 20,000 rows and a million columns, hundreds of thousands. Um, and then the question is, you know, to study, that's why you get these dots and cluster them. And but actually, it turns out that this experiment is sort of actually pretty complicated, but I think it can be abstracted so you, you can understand the issues that one faces. And, um, and so this is work with Sina. I'm going to try to sort of explain to you why this diagram, for somebody who likes math, sort of abstracts away and, and produces like the experiment. So each plate here is one cell, and for each cell we have these sets. All right. I'm going to go through one by one and tell you what these sets are. And um, we'll try to, you know, we try to pick letters that are representative. So. So this is actually a general picture, but I'll, I'll explain it in the context of single cell RNA-seq. So let's say you have a brain, and you're going to take some cells out of it, and now we're looking at just one cell, because there's many, one for each cell. And for this one cell, this is a cell, and I'm, I'm sorry, I haven't, this completely, I haven't had time yet to make very pretty pictures, but these are, if you think of these green things are molecules in the cell, RNA molecules. So this set is a set of molecules. And you'll see that what makes this picture kind of complicated is that each set is of different things, very different things. So this is a set of molecules. We want to know what was in the set, all right? But we can't just look inside the cell. So we're doing all this crazy sequencing and stuff. And let me talk about C. So C is, of these green things, it's a set of molecules that we capture. So that's why it's called C. But these captured, we didn't, there, there were maybe 300,000 molecules in the cell, we're actually going to capture a tiny fraction. 
not very many. Uh, it's not actually clear. Nobody has really measured yet very carefully how many capture amazingly because I mean, some people have measured it, but it's not so easy to measure. And um, but we're probably depending on the technology, you might measure more or less, ten percent, maybe more, maybe fifty percent. But so these are okay. But these molecules are in a different. They're they're a set of molecules still, but these molecules are actually in freezer. Okay? So so we've captured some of these molecules. And we've made new ones, actually. They're, they're not actually as much like we pulled them out of the freezer. By various biochemistry tricks, we've made new molecules. But, but if you chase this map, there's a function that takes each one of these and provides a unique one of the original ones. Okay? So each one of these corresponds to an original unique molecule. But they're new molecules. These molecules are called cDNAs. And they sit inside the freezer. Um, this is called in uh, uh, sort of it's basically a library in, in biology. Actually, the, the L stands for library because what, when biologists say the word library, they actually mean not these molecules that I drew here, but copies of them. Each of them has been duplicated lots of times. And the, that's why process is called PCR. And the reason basically for that is that in trying to like create copies of these things, you need to do copying reactions, otherwise you don't have enough material and it's too hard to work. So the technology is such that there are molecules here, you basically have representatives of a handful of them here, but each of these representatives it appears in some multiplicity that's actually unknown to you. Okay? And that's called a, a library. Um, is that clear? So, um, so, of course, each one of these molecules represents one copy of the many copies of it in the library. So this is an inclusion map, right? This guy is sort of, this is sort of a subset of that set. But this set uh, maps injectively to that set. Uh, let's talk about U. U is a set of sequences, and it's, uh, it stands for UMI, which I should write on the slide, a unique uh, molecular identifier. Now, these are going to be short sequences that are have been synthetically attached to the sequence to the molecules that are inside uh, this set over here. And the reason they're needed, remember I told you that each of these needs to represent one of those. Um, you might have molecules in here that are the same. Like in this set, you may have had two copies of gene one. Maybe it's represented by two copies of gene one here, but those the actual sequences of gene one are exactly the same in these two copies, but you want to tell them apart. So you add one of these unique molecular identifiers. Okay. Now, I'll tell you in a minute how these are delivered uh, in an experiment. The number of them in a typical experiment now is actually something that sort of experimentally could be tuned. And interestingly, I think, in all of the technology development, in a lot of it that I'm aware of, these things have been picked kind of on intuition, not too much on like thought. A little bit, but most on intuition. And so if those sequences are of length L, uh, then there's four to the L different um, uh, possible sequences. Um, but actually this said U, um, you know, I should, um, I should write this like this. This said U is some subset of, um, uh, you know, uh, of those sequences, right? So it's sort of, you picked, there are four to the L sequences and you picked some subset. Um, did I write this? I think I wrote this on the So this is a set of identifiers for the sequence. Now F consists of DNA sequence. This is the sequencing that you have done of molecules in here. And this is called the FASTQ file. And it doesn't look very pretty, but you can see CCATGA, the sequencer. These funky letters here are actually called quality scores. They represent the fidelity of like how, 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 what your belief is in the accuracy of a specific base or sequence. These days, almost all of these sequences have like one error less than 10,000. So they're very reliable, high fidelity representatives of the molecules in here. Remember, these are the captured molecules in some multiplicity. Now, it's interesting. The reason I put an injective map here is because not every single molecule in here is actually sampled in the sequencing way. So there's two 
samplings. You've dipped into this pool and grabbed out a subset. And now you're dipping into this pool and grabbing out another subset. Okay, so, so this is a, a file, and, and that's, so it's really a subset. But for each read, it came conceptually from one molecule. All right, B. Okay, um, the reason I used B is because we have a format that we've developed called a bus file. So B stands for bus. Um, and bus stands for barcode UMI set. So you've already heard the word UMI. Um, a barcode in this jargon of this field is actually also a sort of sequence like we have here, but for identifying the cell. And here you know, I'm already inside one cell, so there was some sequence that identified the cell from, and I'm ignoring that right now, I'm sort of thinking about one cell. And S is actually a set of targets. So S is a set of targets. And by that I mean in the genome we have genes, I call them gene one, gene two, Gene three, there are a lot of there are a lot of genes, like gene n, and these genes are sequences, and for each of these fragments, I've identified a set of potential targets that it actually could have come from. I may not be able to identify it uniquely, but and this is called often an alignment. Okay? So I have basically taken sequences that represent these and seen how they look like in comparison to known genes that I have. Okay? So that's this set B. I'm almost done with this. I hope I'm not going too slowly or too fast. Going too slowly. So T is um, a set of targets, so I've drawn my eyes here, that's a subset of these captured molecules. Remember, each captured molecule here corresponded to some target. Right? But it's a subset because we only sampled from these. And you know, each of these is represented by one record here because these are the targets that not just were captured here, but that made it into our bus file that we were able to actually sequence and examine. So this is, I have, if you remember, I think three guys here, now we have two. So the, moving from here to here is basically collapsing the, this multiplicity that we introduced in this experimental step. Okay, I is, consists of the UMIs, the, the, bar, the molecular identifiers from here, that actually appeared in these sequences that we ended up actually sequencing and capturing. Right? And so, so this is a bijection because for each target you know, that we actually found, there was a unique molecular identifier and these are a subset of all of the ones we saw. Right? So uh, that's kind of the structure of an experiment and we measure this, the questions we have are, well, how do we know what these were? Uh, how do we know what these were? And also, what was the size of this? How much did we capture? And also, what was the size of that? And, and what was the relative amount? And, and you know, how many things were here? And we have access to all of this because we measured something. And so, and, and really, the fundamental question here, question zero is, you know, to figure out the sizes of all of these sets. Amazingly, I think it's fair to say, this field is now about 10 years old. There's a paper every day, and there's standard software people use. And I'll show you in a second that actually, amazingly, nobody's actually really carefully thought about how to actually, about these most basic questions. And much to the detriment of the field, because people are kind of ad hoc choosing parameters for these various things. You can tune how many copies you make of these molecules. And you can tune if you wanted to mess with the technology here, the, the, how many of these barcodes you have, and all of these things are tunable in, in my lab because we have possibility to actually change some of these things. Um, but we've been asking the question, like, what's the best way to get from here to here, algorithmically, but then maybe actually it's better to get from here to here if we tweak the multiplicity. Okay, so that's what we've been thinking about. Um, so let me tell you just how this is implemented for a second because it's kind of interesting in and of itself. Um, this is a picture of an emulsion. So I don't have a toy I sometimes bring with me, but if you, you know, emulsion is a mix of oil and water, like if after it rains on the streets. And these are water droplets in oil. And actually, we made these water droplets. They're, they're very uniform. Um, one of the things we work with in my lab, and I'll just mention this because I think it's relevant for why, you know, information is in this field is that 
So the, the instruments to, to make an emulsion like this is just a little pump. And uh, these pumps are a few thousand dollars, they're really not that expensive, but we've been working on 3D printed solutions to make instruments that are very, very cheap. For, and so ba today, basically every biology lab can produce this data. It's not like an astronomy where you have one telescope uh, for all the astronomers. So this ability to make uniform emulsions done with microfluidics is how you implement this experiment. So this is uh, from a paper in Drops. It's a technology that was published about three or four years ago now. Um, came out of Harvard. It's a sort of do-it-yourself technology. And you can, I mean, if you understood the sets I just displayed, well, here's the cell. So inside it are, is all these molecules that are in R, in the cell R. This is a synthetic bead and these little, it looks like a hairy ball. Each of these little blue lines is one of those barcodes, the set U. So the set U is all the sequences that are on this little synthetic thing. And now you see this called cDNA synthesis. So by some hocus pocus magic, you make molecules that you're going to put in the freezer. And that's going to be the set L. Right? And you can see the word PCR here because there's some sequences in these constructs on these blue things that will enable you to copy them. Um, and so all that's going to happen and you're going to get uh, the set L. So that's kind of how it works. These kind of microfluidic technologies have been commercialized. You can do them in every lab now. So it's really like scalable. Right? That's why that curve is going so quickly. Every lab now starts buying an instrument or doing this experiment, producing tons of data. So let me show you something very simple we did and we discovered. So the first question you might ask is like, how many actually molecules were there on this bead? given the samples you drew from this and that came from that. Now, I don't have the time, um, to, so I'm already running late to explain exactly how I did it, so I'm not going to do that, but it's, it's simple math, I'll show you. So, um, um, so a bit of a calculation. And, um, well, there's actually two technologies we looked at. There's a company, 10X Genomics, and they make, they've had two versions of their technology. One had um, beads of length 10, and the other, be, uh, sorry, L, L equals 10, the other had L equals 14. Um, and so uh, with L equals 10, you would expect just over a million different possible sequences, four to the 10. Uh, but what we actually see is that on individual beads, these are each one experiment, and this is the variation from cell to cell, or from you know, droplet to droplet. Uh, so some, so the beads are not actually exactly the same. There's some beads have more, some have less, uh, but that's the diversity of the beads. This is an important number to know uh, because it turns out later you need to know how many collisions you have, you know, where two different molecules happen to get the same uh, bead. Well, that's why this calculation is important. You can see that in the new technology V3, where it's two to the 14th, it's about 60 million. Um, the, the number of, thing, of, of, of distinct sequences on each bead is much higher. So you'll have a lot fewer collisions. So this is a good calculation to make because, yeah. Um, I'm not going to show you the calculation, but actually the, uh, I had to just, I wanted to say one math thing. And, um, and I just came from a conference that was fascinating where I was very lucky to be invited uh, with astronomers to discuss how we're going to detect life in the outer universe. Okay. Um, and I really like this calculation it's from my colleague, Mike Steele. The probability that there's life in the universe is 0.42. And it boils down to calculating a Poisson random variable, the probability that you see a, at least two things conditioned on if you saw at least one. And it's very simple, very, very simple, but this sort of is the basic that drives it. It's not complicated to, to make. <clears throat> Let me talk about, uh, sorry, go ahead. Whether, whether the, the additional things that you attach onto the samples is, you know, has to be complementary or is attached at one end or the other. Um, there's no particular reason. I mean, one can make a sort of macroscopic argument that the marginal distributions uh, have this Poisson characteristic, but they need not. Correct. Disrupting that probability <coughs> distribution Everything you do disrupts probability distributions. So that counting at the end 
you can gets you back to whether the questions you want to answer are yes or no or something quantitative. And if you don't care about what the disruption to the probability distributions are, you could try to answer yes or no questions. But otherwise, if you want quantitative answers, it's very tricky because you really need to know the probability mechanism of what disrupts the... Uh, You're completely right. correct. So in, when we make this calculation, which I mentioned now, we, we, there's obviously a fundamental assumption that there was uniform sampling, for example. We made that assumption. Well, but the PCR may not even be uniform. Correct. And so when one is analyzing this kind of thing, uh, for this calculation, we assumed uniformity, but we verified it. So we looked at the data. We, we have many, many cells. And so we convinced ourselves that, I don't know if the plus to show it, that actually the sampling of these synthetic PMIs is uniform. You're right that the PCR is not uniform. And for the next calculation I'll show you, which is estimating the size of C, we're not going to assume anything about the, you know, how much each molecule was amplified. So sometimes we'll make assumptions, sometimes we don't. So let me remind you, so C is the, the set of molecules that were captured. And of course, they're not, we didn't see all of these because we only sequenced the subset from the duplicated copies. We can sort of deduplicate these because the copies of the molecule here will have the same UMI. That's the reason why we care about the collisions that they have. So, but you have to take my word for it. There are actually almost no collisions that one has to worry about if one does things the right way. Because the number of extractions we're taking from here is very small relative to the diverse models. Um, so this is like sort of a very sim simple calculation. So, um, so this plot is shown for an actual data set if, that was sequenced at some depth. So that is to say F at some certain size. If you took two copies, three copies, 20, 20 times, so this is times the sampling, what fraction of C will you have seen? It's kind of like the coupon counting model, very simple model. And what we saw for this data set is that actually you're at about 25%. And um, actually, I'm not so familiar with this literature, but we used a nice recent work on this that I, sorry, I, I just want to put up here. Um, it's from a recent paper from folks at USC, computational biologists, but this is a field that people work on here, and it's, there's a lot of statistics behind this. Um, but what I wanted to show you is that, uh, just to give you a sense of the state of our field and why even really most elementary calculations can be useful. So there is software called Cell Ranger that is provided by this company, 10 Genomics, that, whose data I just showed you some numbers for. And they actually provide, when you use their software, a saturation curve. And this is the same data set, and this is the saturation curve they show. And it's completely different. They're claiming that, so this experiment, this is how much they sequenced in the whole experiment. So that was the number one in our previous plot. Let me go back here. So here, I'm saying 25% for, one, for, for what we actually sequenced. They're saying that already there, we're at 75%. 77%. Um, and I know, we, when we saw this, we, it's kind of really shocking because the number of people who use the software, and it's, it's not just that this is a calculation that's interesting, it's fundamental to choices you make as a biologist. Because if you think that with this amount of sequencing, you've seen the majority of your molecules, then you don't do more sequencing. But if you actually know that you're 25%, you may choose to sequence more. Also, the actual shape of this curve is very important because it tells you how much bang for your buck you're getting. I mean, eventually you can't afford to get more. So, uh, you know, so if you look at like what they actually say on their website about how they made this curve, I mean, uh, I won't waste time. This is one of those things where I took a class as an undergraduate once in, math in topology where every wrong statement we wrote, you got minus five points. So you get minus infinity on the exam. And this would be an example with a very negative score. There's just a lot of statements here that I don't understand. I don't really know how they made this curve exactly. 
but it's not the right curve and it has real implication because the other thing is you can control so uh, this this duplication the PCR that's something that's that's distinct to every experiment every experiment you choose how many rounds of PCR to do and that will change the, the complexity of the library which is to say the support of the library and so and that will change the shape of this curve so really it's something that should be a tool in every toolbox and that's the most basic thing so in the remaining time, I want to tell you sort of, so that, that's just the most basic aspects of the experiment. Um, and then I want to tell you sort of what people are doing now. And I thought I'd give one example from my own lab, the, the technology we actually developed in our lab, uh, to multiplex experiments. And that leads to all sorts of interesting, I think, information for other questions about how to think about this data. And questions of the form of like, what could we hope to learn from this? Um, and also how to optimize this experiment. So usually in single cell, you would get a bunch of cells and you would get out a matrix. Uh, but my postdoc, Jay Steering, developed a method for um, tagging the cells with synthetic molecules that kind of pretend to be RNA. And so they get scooped up in all the sequencing and they essentially serve as barcodes for the sample. So you can take one sample of cells, a different sample, same type of cells, or maybe from the replica or from another experiment, and tag each of them uniquely and then pull them all together in one experiment. And the reason this is really nice is because one of the big issues in biology is that because of these PCR cycles and other issues, there's a lot of batch effect. If you do a separate library preparation for each experiment, you're going to have apples and oranges. So here, everything gets done together. It also is a new knob. We can trade off more reads or more samples from one cell versus less of that per, per cell versus more reads, uh, sorry, more cells uh, in more samples. So we can turn up doing more samples rather than more um, uh, reads per sample. Um, well, I, I had this slide from the previous talk and so I put it up, this is the chemistry. Um, for this audience, maybe not so interesting exactly how all this chemistry works, but this is sort of, um, I think it's interesting to uh, I, I, I don't know any biochemistry really, and it's sort of um, fascinating. You know, this requires, it's really, it requires a, a large bank of knowledge and creativity about what will work and not work in putting them together, and James did that uh, basically in his lab. Um, and so, uh, to give an idea of what you can do now, so we did an experiment, uh, this was kind of a proof of principle, where we took uh, neural stem cells and we perturbed them with some different factors at different levels of perturbation to create a cube of experiments, um, essentially 96 experiments. So this is uh, you know, growth factor and these, these various perturbations uh, to see how the cells respond. So we have a matrix of experiments like this. And for each experiment, we're gonna get a whole lot of cells. Uh, basically dividing up the cells into these experiments. And I have to be honest then, I think, um, we haven't thought about this too much, we've thought about it a little bit, but it's actually fairly complicated to think about how to even think about this kind of data because, um, you know, we basically have a tensor of data now, right, um, a matrix, and, you know, this is a naive way you might look at the data where you, like, look at each single experiment is a whole bunch of dots, um, and these are this, you know, uh, this is a highlight of which uh, so, you know, so I'm only showing you two of the perturbations. There was a third perturbation, and this is showing for the third perturbation which cells were represented there uh, with respect to the other two perturbations. I think one of the sort of interesting discoveries just from this kind of experiment, which we did this only about a, a year or two ago, and at the time it was already one of the largest experiments in terms of number of samples that have been done. Um, and, you know, I should say that collecting data like this is on the order of seven thousand dollars it's not because we've just done a standard we've divided about ten thousand cells into these samples we don't have a lot of cells per sample but it appears that that the data is quite low dimensional which is interesting because people already kind of know that a single single cell experiment is low dimensional but even with respect to these perturbations the samples are low dimensional so that's kind of interesting um, and more recently, we've done another experiment, which I would show, thought I'd show you, because it's really um, quite challenging to analyze. And uh, we, we have 
And doing it, but I think there's a lot of room for innovation. It's also kind of a cool experiment, so I think I'll show you. So this is in collaboration with David Anderson, who's a neuroscientist at Caltech, and his postdoc Brady Weisberg. And um, they are very interested in the jellyfish because uh, they, uh, they are behavioral neuroscientists. And one of the things people do in neuroscience is they put, they edit genes that are specific to certain regions of the brain to fluoresce when they're being used and turned on. And then they put little fiber optic cables into the brains of mice so that they can see when these genes are active. But one of, you know, this jellyfish is you see through, so, uh, so that kind of experiment is really great. You know, no optical fibers needed. But this jellyfish, while it had been studied quite substantially by a group in France, really only one group had looked at it, and nothing is really known about the cell types in this organism. And it used to be in biology that to figure out an organism and all its cell types would take years, something like the fruit fly. And uh, I'm going to show you that we kind of learned, have learned in about a year a huge amount about this animal. I think that's really exciting for biology because you can take any animal and do what I'm about to show you. So, so, we, took, um, so we took this jellyfish and we actually did uh, 10 uh, different jellyfish, <coughs> five jellyfish that were fed and five that were starved. Kind of an interesting experiment to see what's the difference between fed and starved. Now remember, this is going to be kind of interesting because we're going to get to see cells from individual cell types in the jellyfish and how they change when you, you know, fed or starved the animal. So we did two library preparations here and we, you know, created a design that mixes the samples. In this case, we did what's called two lanes of high seek, a couple of thousand dollars, about 13,000 cells, and we get a picture like this. And so this is actually a nice picture. Each dot here is colored according to which individual it came from. And what you see here is it looks like a mess, meaning that we didn't appear to not have had a lot of batch effect here. Right? Every, every cell doesn't appear to care exactly which, you know, uh, it's all muddled together. Now, the first thing you can do, um, there's so much, so much stuff to, to do better here, but the, the first thing you can do is kind of project this data somehow to two dimensions, and biologists have become fans of a method called TSME, which is T-stochastic neighbor embedding, but there's a lot of methods to do this, and some of them are more principled than others. Um, then there's a clustering that happens. Usually the clustering is actually done in, not in two, not on this projector, but in higher dimension. By the way, all of these choices about how to do this are completely ad hoc in the field right now. PCA to 50 dimensions, so, you know, cluster with this algorithm and play with the clusters until it looks nice for the paper, really, that's how it works. Um, and then we took each of these clusters and this is a jellyfish. We get some gene sequences, the genome had been sequenced already. And then we use this program BLAST. We like, look in the whole database of everything that's ever been sequenced and try to see what does this gene look like to be able to figure out what does this thing do, <coughs> this group of cells. And in many cases, we're still blank. But in many cases, we do know something, like neuronal subtype, because you see a whole bunch of genes that in other related animals are in neurons, and can be characterized. And I have to say that, for me, as you know, I was, I, I find this, looking at this picture should kind of blow you away, right? You're looking at a, a merge of 10 animal cells, but they're the same animal, and you're actually looking at the animal. Right? I mean, it's, it doesn't look like a jellyfish because it's in this transcriptional space, but every single type of cell, this animal, each one of these individuals is about 100,000 cells. So we've sampled basically probably all cell types that occur at like 1% in this animal. Um, it's really um, uh, very interesting to look at individual clusters. Uh, here are specific genes that are known to neuroscientists to be active in stem cells, uh, neural stem cells versus mature cells are highlighted. And this is actually sort of, you can see a dynamic picture here where some of these cells are sort of progenitors, they're over here, and then they kind of turn into mature neurons that are located right there. So that's, those are the neurons of this jellyfish. And now we're in a position to ask what are the transcriptionally activated genes in the neurons of jellyfish? That is very, I mean, the collaborator Brady Weisberg, what he's doing with this kind of data, he's working on the genetic engineering so he can replace one of these with, you know, uh, basically edit it and make it fluoresce when it's turned on. And 
but really is on the verge of being able to do experiments with this animal and see what the neurons are doing in response to stimuli so just on the basis of like looking at these kind of data. I haven't talked yet about Fred versus Stark, but you can kind of see just the first order. So I made two copies here. This is just the inverse of the other because otherwise the colors dominate. So here purple is Fred and here Stark is Fred. But you can see in some of the clusters here, it's kind of all mushed up. Then in some cases, it's sort of more clumped together. You know, there's a large clumping of Fed and here, you know, it's just good. So, um, so I won't tell you more about that. What I wanted to tell you is that, you know, so if I was going to be very pedantic, I would now write out all the sets we have now because now it's not just one single cell, but there. And you want to know, like, how much did we capture of all the cells in this animal? And that animal, you know, it's getting very complicated very quickly, right? Um, uh, you know, and how do you fig figure out, you know, in some of these cases, some of these um, cell types have changed in abundance, how many of the cells there are, versus in other cases, the genes that are expressed in them have shifted. In. So I don't know, there's a lot of things to do. Um, what I wanted to show you, though, is that, this is really fine, um, is that truly, these are the tools people use, and they are very uh, ad hoc, um, and uh, I mean, it's just screaming uh, for people like you to come and help uh, figure out what's going on, right? Because biologists are very smart, very good, but they're not classically trained by and large in all the fields that are necessary to figure out. Like, so when does it make sense to use TSE and what assumptions about the data will drive the, the projections? And, um, you know, should you cluster this way or that way? And what's the theoretical guarantees on these clustering algorithms? Um, uh, you know, for example, Vasilis Garnos, who's been a postdoc here, uh, you know, uh, a year or two ago, uh, published a, a very fast method, a new fast method for this problem, inspired by looking at these data that's close to linear in the number of cells, which is a whole other thing, because if you have a million cells, it starts taking time to do this. I mean, you should also imagine, like in 10 years, we've gone from one to a million. Where will we be in 10 years from now? Um, just to convince you of this, I wanted to show you um, a data set that was published by this company just two years ago of 68,000 cells from blood and, uh, you know, produced a matrix of 20,000 by 68,000. You don't have to take my word for that, just write down. They took, they applied k-means to the data, to the first 50 principal components from the thousand most variable genes of the data. And I always feel like if, I, I, I really <coughs> wish I'd just used 999 here. <laughs> so, um, and then they, you know, these pictures they made with this visualization. Um, one of the exciting things is that in genomics, it's a field where there's been a lot of um, collective decision to by and large share all the data. You can go today and download this data set or a ton of different data sets. Um, and one of the projects uh, worked on um, just in the last year, and I, I think I'm running out of time, so I won't have time to tell the whole story, but we looked at the picture, and uh, these are blood cells. It's actually, again, you have to stop and actually appreciate where we are, where you, you take some blood and you run it through some machine, and you can see all the different types of blood cells in the map. This used to take biologists years to like, try to figure out something like this, right? But, these are different types of blood cells. But here are naive uh, T cells, and cyt naive cytotoxic T cells, and memory cells. And here, in this particular picture, maybe due to how they did the analysis, it's a little bit messy. Uh, maybe it just is, me maybe the cells are mixed. It's something one actually would like to know. And there's actually an interesting case of a specific marker So for these types of cells. So memory T cells, CD45, RO, versus CD45 RA plus, this means that these types of naive T cells, they present this specific um, gene. Uh, so these are cell surface markers, they're called. They're genes that are expressed on the cell surface. And these blood cells are classified by whether this gene is present or not. And so you would hope to see from this data that this gene is there and, um, and here and not there. But when they actually did the analysis, they didn't find that, and the reason is that this gene has what's called many isoforms. So, you know, 
genes basically gluing together of these pieces of sequence, and sometimes they skip six, sometimes you don't. And, um, and it turns out that naive T cells have this version and memory T cells have that. And the way they did their analysis basically masked this um, for reasons that I won't describe in too much detail right now. So they saw uh, the same. And so you know, we looked at this and sort of uh, felt that this was a kind of failed analysis. It failed all around. So, you know, as I told you, there are two positive and one negative. And so you should see the negative should look like this, but the positive should have a difference. And it's like they're all equal. So we try to understand why this is. And, and again, I, I, I don't like to go over and I think I have a few minutes left. So I won't get into the technical issues of what part of the analysis was kind of not so good um, or not the best it could be. But what I will say is that um, uh, we realized that if you process the data in a certain way and keep track of these sets that I mentioned of ambiguity, uh, you could actually pull out this information. And Vasilis and the uh, former graduate student of mine, uh, Lin Yi, uh, basically looked, developed a very simple logistic regression method um, to take these various sets, that's what TCC means here, and try to distinguish cell types, basically find the hyperplane that separates them. And in doing so, uh, so these are these different sets which we're keeping track of, and they vary. Even if you aggregate all of them, which is what this naive analysis was doing, you see no difference. And so, I mean, most of you probably don't care about CD45 and blood cells today, but I wanted to show you this because just to show you how simple analyses and the most basic thinking carefully about the data can have real impact um, in this field. And I, this is a validation of that. So, I won't go into that. so the last thing I'll say is, um, I think I'm almost done, is that I find it also fascinating in this field that this is so much data being produced that there's, you know, people, if you, sit and play with all these parameters, you can kind of also convince yourself of mirages, you know, that you're seeing things that are not real. Um, is this really a cluster different from this one? And so what I've done today is uh, deliver a message to you and I've fooled you. So this has looked like real data, but what I actually did here is, uh, you know, this is not really um, two cell types where the gene Caltech 8 is different from the gene Stanford 4. But actually what I did is I took what's called a Rorschach plot. Um, you know, these are like images where you try to interpret what's in it. And I cut out this part of it. And I showed you a picture, OK? And you, know, you, you were thinking, oh, look at this cell. Uh, OK, so that, and that actually is a, is a very, very serious problem. Um, you know, uh, uh, in biology, it's interesting. It's, it's a field that's very obsessed with p-values and correcting for multiple testing. Uh, but people always, you know, they correct for the multiple testing in the experiment. Then they do another experiment. You know, some of the labs at Stanford are very prolific. And so maybe if you publish 50 papers in a year, you should correct for that. <laughs> maybe you should not publish anything your whole career and wait until you're right before retirement and publish the one paper, right? So. Um, no, so I think it's a real issue because there's just so much um, data that that's also very interesting to think about. So, um, so uh, I'll stop there and uh, take any questions next. <clears throat> uh, a couple quick questions. Yes. First of all, um, when you said that that uh, you you talked about things being low dimensional. Yes. That should mean that in certain Taylor series, the cross product terms vanish, or it may mean that. And so, that, so that's a question. I don't. It's not very well posed, but but nonetheless, are there attempts to see that cross product terms aren't? Okay, so that's, that, that's yeah. one. Let me finish. Sure, sure, sure. Well, the other thing, and I'll just be quick here. Um, looking at principal components says that something is an L2 phenomenon. Okay. Maybe this isn't an L2 phenomenon. It's not. 
uh, you know, so one of the things we've looked at is like L1 distances. And you get very different pictures. I know, yeah. but and, I, and I don't either, but uh, you're a very good question, yeah. So, um, yeah, so let me make a couple of, I don't, know, I, I don't have answers to all your questions, but let me make a couple of comments. So, um, so th th there's kind of, there are people in geometry that look at manifold learning and, and try to find Yeah, for uh, sure, even here. Yeah, absolutely, and um, uh, and it's actually kind of a, another pet peeve in this field. People like to say this looks like a manifold. Uh, but that actually is kind of interesting because often these cells, um, uh, I don't show and talk about this, but these cells actually often are developing. You saw a little bit about this in the jellyfish case where these neurons are developing, but you'll have a bunch of cells in there. In one experiment, you'll see cells at different development stages, and then they might take a fork, and you know you might have cells that go here and go there, and they call this a manifold, and that really drives me nuts because the one thing that a manifold is not is that. Um, but um, <laughs> not smooth manifolds. It's not a smooth manifold, yeah. But um, but, but this may not be smooth manifolds. Yeah, but I but I would so I think it's been come quite clear that these cells do not lie in linear spaces, so that. It's clear from various analyses people have done. Um, but it's not really clear how to f do manifold when on, and, you know, fit manifolds to these structures. Um, but one of the reasons is like the dimensions here are very high, right? This is happening. But it's so, not so much that, it's getting at where the splits are. Yeah, and where the splits are also is complicated. So I don't have answers for you. you know, people haven't done good really careful study of what the dimensions are. There's actually, you know, what is really the dimensionality that's relevant and what is really the structure of the data? I don't know how to answer your question. Um, a final question. Yes. Um, it may be that cell types are not sufficient dis things to discriminate, um, and so you should get down to isoforms themselves. Now that could lead to combinatorial problems that you wouldn't want to focus on, but maybe, maybe some <clears throat> looking at clustering or something like that would tell you which pairs of isoforms. Oh, totally. So the whole point of this, I didn't come through because it was going very quickly, but this analysis is exactly about looking at the isoforms in this gene rather than just the gene. Exactly what I believe in. That's one of my main foresights to Thanks. do exactly that. Um, I will also add that a very interesting development in this field and yet another layer of complexity is that it's now possible in a single cell to measure not just the RNA, but also the protein that it uses. And also other aspects. They're you can compute that. Uh, no, I mean, you can measure it. Like, you can do the biochemistry so that some of the reads are telling you about which proteins were there, alongside which RNAs. And so you have some multimodal data in one cell, uh, making this all much more interesting and actually adding a temporal inference that you can do on the data because the protein, say you measure a protein sequence <coughs> in the same cell. Well, that was an RNA molecule a little while ago. So you're actually seeing kind of a sort of snapshot of what was in the cell a few minutes before you see. So, um, so that's also very interesting about that. But no, I, I really agree with you. I think the combinatorics of the isoforms is key. And this is an example where the gene expression as a whole hasn't changed at all. But this is showing that specific isoforms there was action in that, in that domain. And yes, I think some cell types are characterized by specific isoforms of specific genes. Um, and that has been difficult to assess. But, yeah. Speaking of the temporal component, what is the current um, like time scale? Like how, how much time does it take you to get from the measurements to these pictures? You can't just do something like this, like, you know, like multiple. Oh, yeah. Time. So. So first of all, people do experiments where they take cells that are developing and fix them in time and then do experiments together. Uh, yeah, there's uh, uh, like data sets like that all the time. Um, there's tons of data on the way. But uh, can you also ask, like, how long does it take to do one of these experiments? And not long at all. Uh, to, to take cells and to prepare them for sequencing a day or two, and then maybe depend, you know, the sequencing currently is, is like, um, has, is, um, it's bottlenecked by like sequencing centers that, but it's a week or two, and it depends if you're wealthy and you have your own machine or not. But it, well, an experiment like this takes a week or two to, 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 to perform and collect the data. And uh, so it's very easy to actually do this. And there are now commercial companies 
I mentioned one that produce instruments that if you don't want to use some do it yourself, get you know, pay a few thousand. And the instruments are fifty or hundred grand, but then a few thousand dollars for the experiments. And that, you know, Stanford has a whole bunch of these. What's your current proposed health screen method for the single cell data? Um, I, 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 I don't have, uh, you know, preferred methods. You hate them all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, there's a new paper that, so th this method Louvain clustering has been very popular. Last, last week, uh, two or a few weeks, recently they published Leyden uh, clustering. Uh, so Talk about it there as well? Yeah, uh, no, no, uh, this is some, some Dutch people. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, I, I really hate all the clustering methods. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, actually, well, let me answer your question more seriously. So what I believe in, and this is where having a, a lab together with a computational group is interesting, is that, you see, basically, like, when you do an experiment like, like this one that I showed you here, um, the, 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 the actual different conditions, they can define the cell types. Like, when you see a group of cells that co-occur in a specific set of conditions, then they kind of form some natural definition of, Type. I kind of like the idea of using experimental perturbations to understand um, which cells are, you know, be basically behave, behaving in correlated ways. Um, yeah, so that's one thing I think is going to be useful. Yeah. I just want to jump off one of your later slides and link that back to some sort of theory and question. You had, um, you know, just a lot of the time these these 2D clusterings when they're shown are shown with uh, the markers like CD4 type positive etc yes. next to next to the clusters those are those are just enrichments when they're listed like that they're listed as being knowledge the colors are of course again just from the algorithm they're listed as being knowledge and so on and so forth break it down as violin plots uh, for, for the enrichment, but it doesn't give you the counterfactual of if you had tried a different clustering algorithm, could would there be one that would split it apart better? And so just if you had any comments on how to um, both sell that better in terms of these, these pictures, the, the idea that there's no counterfactual notion of what the truth is being presented as here. Okay, so very, very good question. My, my I didn't properly describe this experiment, but actually, the way they were able to label these cells as such is because what, what they actually did is that they did a separate experiment where they took cells that were purified for having these markers, like fax sorry, sure. and they actually aligned these cells to those. I so guess my, my question is more about when they're not the fax markers, like uh, it's done a lot just for um, yeah. distinctive markers for cell type, just being written like that next to the colored blob. That's right. I just but they did fax sorting here, but it's a good question. And you know, we've actually played a lot with this specific data set and messed with this closing parameters. It's, you, you, you can't like, it's not easy to separate them out. I think that this is not, a, you know, a parameter tuning issue. Yeah, uh, I just I just mean in the in the general practice in single cell yes. in the single cell world of still having this type of figure even when it's not fax markers exclusively yes. which sit next to those for presentation reasons and how that gets read because you could try a different clustering method or the clustering with a different yeah. set of parameters. If I you, think that's yeah, a problem mean, in the field. Okay. No, nobody reports anything except the picture sure. without any justification for how any of the parameters are chosen, and I can tell you for a fact that the way they're chosen is somebody sits around and messes with the parameters to make it look. Because when this is in the yeah. context of discovery of cell types, it just becomes all moving targets. Oh, I mean, it's, so I'm part of something called the Human Brain Initiative, where I'm, I'm part of a very tiny group where we're trying to figure out the cell types in the mouse brain. And, um, you know, it's kind of like, uh, uh, you know, like, there's a joke on Jewish, and they said two Jews have three opinions. And so uh, <laughs> you have like, you have this consortium and everybody, has three clustering that is alike, and you know, it's like arguing until, yeah. It, it actually, I think a good place to look to is in systematics. People who study like species in both phylogenetic trees, yeah, they've argued for a long time about like, whether these are the same species or different species, and you know, it's not very, and yeah, it's kind of very ad hoc. And, you know, you like, think info theory might have anything to say there, just in terms of how Yeah, I think that much, I think the literature there should be looked at, but right now it's at the level of, my religion is I'm a splitter and I'm a lumper and you know. <laughs> yeah. so, so what kind of result does theoretical or experimental um, you would like to see from somebody's perspective that will convince you that a certain 
way of doing filtering the, the sound. Oh, so you know, there, so this is a good aspect of this field. There is a very simple experiment actually. So once you, let's say you you want to see whether blue is really blue, right? Is it really special, right? So you go and find these marker genes, and then you can do an experiment called you know, an in situ experiment, where you can actually take the tissue. In this case, it's blood, but you know, usually if it's an animal, maybe it's part of the animal's the brain, or, and you can actually like check when is this specific gene expressed in which cells. And you can then like ask, you know, yeah, this marker marked this group here in this picture, but in the animal, like, is it dispersed throughout the animal, or is it spatially, you know, uh, focused on one site, or is it, um, or is it only during a specific period in development that occurs? So people, that's kind of how this is used. They'll do some clustering, they pick out some genes that mark these clusters, and then they go and test them and see whether they have actual some apparently physiological uh, relevance. That's what people do, I think. How do you spell Leiden? That, uh, L-E-I-D and like the city in, 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 in So the field has been largely focused on uh, defining cell types, including atlases, still organisms. Uh, it seems like it's moving more towards within a specific cell type. Can we do differential, differential expression between conditions? For example, star, not star. Uh, but I haven't seen too much about that. Do you foresee like uh, issues with confounding? No, so I think these multiplexing technologies are really key. I mean, I really think this multiplexing is a trivial technical thing, but it's very fundamental because I think it allows experiments. All these cells are being pulled together. It's actually much better than previous expression analyses where people didn't pull, they did separate libraries. Um, I mean, I think all the field will be doing this very soon. There's now actually at least almost five to 10 different multiplexing technologies with different strengths and weaknesses, not just ours. And I absolutely foresee but that's, every experiment will be like this. I mean, these atlases are a little bit boring in arguing about the splitting and, and lumping. Um, I think, you know, there's a possibility to do every experiment in a single cell level. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think it's kind of like, um, uh, it, it's exactly like this. So, um, actually, let me just back here. So I showed this picture right in the beginning. Um, I'll just, uh, okay, so. Um, and you know, it's, it's actually interesting. So in 2007, Illumina released multiplexing technology for the sequencing, where you could put different samples on one sequencer, and that is exactly what enabled all these sequencing samples. Because if you had to go and pay for a whole sequencing experiment for each one, you couldn't do it. I think this is exactly analogous. So in a single cell domain, the ability to multiplex samples, they're going to have a similar effect where it goes the other way. But, you know, um, yeah, you, because you can split the cells. Uh, you know, otherwise paying 10,000 cells for each sample is way too expensive. Okay. Yeah, I think it's gonna just take over, like all the experiments would be multiplexed, I'm sure. Yeah. 